So that's an example of where yeah, you've got a choice to make. You can't say you want to balance the budget, deal with our deficit, um, invest in our kids, and have a $700 billion tax cut that affects only 2% of the population. You just can't do it. And so I hope that as you go forward, not just over the next six weeks before the election, but over the next two years or next six years or next ten years, as you're examining what's taking place in Washington, that you just keep in mind that um, we're not going to be able to solve our big problems unless we honestly address them. Uh, and it means that we've got to make choices and we've got to decide what's important. And if we think our kids are important and the next generation is important, then you know, we've got to act like it. And we can't pretend that uh, they're you know, shortcuts or uh, that we can c cut our taxes, completely have all the benefits that we want, and balance the budget, uh, and not make any tough choices. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I think more than anything, the message that I want to be communicating uh, to the American people uh, in, in the months and years ahead. Anyway, with that, uh, I just want to open it up. I know that uh, there are microphones somewhere in the audience. We've got these terrific young people who have volunteered. They'll, uh, so uh, just raise your hand and they'll find you. Here you go. Why don't we start right here? And please introduce yourself. Good morning, Mr. President. My name's Mary Steer. Welcome back to Iowa. Thank We're you, thrilled Mary. to have you back. It's here. great to be back. I have a 24 year old son who campaigned fiercely for you mm -hmm. and was very inspired by your message of hope. Yeah. He graduated from Simpson College about a year and a half ago with honors. Congratulations. And he's still struggling to find a full time job. Right. And he and many of his friends are struggling. They are losing their hope, which was a message that you inspired them with. Could you speak to that, how you would speak to the young men and women in our country who are struggling to find a job, and speak to that message of hope? Well, you know, I was in Madison, Wisconsin yesterday, and we had about 25,000 mostly young people uh, come out. And it was, it, it was a terrific reminder of uh, the fact that young people still have so much energy and so much... Uh, enthusiasm for the future. Uh, but they're going through a tough time. Look, uh, this generation that is coming of age uh, is going through the toughest economy of any generation since the 1930s. That's, that, that's pretty remarkable. M most of us, in fact, I'm just looking around the room, I think it's fair to say nobody here remembers the economy of, of the Great Depression. So the worst economy we had gone through, uh, maybe, maybe one, <laughs> maybe one, maybe, maybe a couple. But, but you guys look really good for your age, though. So, um, but for most of us, you know, the worst we had seen before was the 1981 recession, the 1991 recession, and then uh, the recession in 2001. This recession had more impact on middle class families than those other three recessions combined in terms of job loss and how it's affected people's incomes. So that's going to have an effect on an entire generation. It means that they're worried about the future in a way that most of us weren't worried when we got out of college. Now, uh, here's the good news, and I've, I've said this to, to young people. Uh, I think that this generation, uh, your son's generation, is smarter, more sophisticated, uh, more passionate, have, has a broader worldview. Um, I think that they don't take things for granted. They're willing to work hard for what uh, uh, whatever they can achieve. Uh, I think they think about the community uh, and other people, and th they don't just have a narrow focus on what's in it for me. Uh, I, when I meet young people these days, I, I am very impressed with them. I, I think they're they are terrifically talented, and so. Uh, so their future will be fine. But in the short term, uh, what I'd say to them is that, first of all, 
Uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that they can get the best education possible. One of the things that we did this year that didn't get a lot of attention was we were able to change the student loan program out of the federal government to save about $60 billion that's going to go directly to students in the form of higher grants, uh, reduced loan burdens, uh, debt burdens when they get out of college. It's going to make a, a difference to them. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure they can succeed educationally. Number two, obviously we're doing everything we can to grow the economy so that if they've got the skills, they're going to be able to find a job in this new economy. And as I said, we've seen private sector job growth eight consecutive months now. The economy is growing. It's just not growing as fast as we'd like it, partly because there's still some headwinds. We had some overhang because of all the problems in the housing market, and the housing market's a big chunk of our economy. Um, all that excess inventory of houses that were built during the housing bubble, they're getting absorbed, and, and slowly that will start improving. Uh, so the expectation is, is that although we're not growing as fast as we can, if we're making some good choices about providing small businesses tax breaks and uh, helping to shore up the housing market, that over the next couple of years you're going to start seeing steadily the economy improving. And if, if young people like your son are prepared, if they're focused and equipped, they're going to be able to find uh, a good job. In the meantime, what we've also done is made sure, for example, that your son can stay on your health insurance until the age of 26, which be, because of health care reform. And that is going to relieve some of the you know, uh, stress that they're feeling right now. Uh, and then finally, what I'd tell your son is, is that we're trying to make some tough decisions now so that by the time he has his own son or daughter, that we are back to number one in research and development, back to number one in the proportion of college graduates, back to number one in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship, that we have succeeded in creating a competitive America uh, that, uh, that, that you know, will ensure this 21st century is, is the American century just like the 20th century was. Um, but it's going to take some time. And, and so the main message I have to young people, in some ways this generation may be less fixed on immediate gratification than our generation was, uh, partly because they've seen uh, you know, how, some hardship in their own families and, and in, their own, uh, in their own careers. Okay, who's next? Gentleman right here. My name's Bob Brammer. I live about five or six blocks away in Beaverdale, and we're really glad you came, came here, Mr. President. Thank you. It's My not hard to come here. This is a nice neighborhood, by the way. Is, I mean, great. I, I love these big here, trees. Here. So, yeah, it's beautiful. My, my question relates to things halfway around the world and how they affect the economy, mm -hmm. particularly the Oops. wars and the enormous amount of spending that has gone into that in the, over the last decade, not just the last couple of years. So this is what I'd ask. Those decade-long conflicts have had an enormous cost in terms of people killed and wounded, our men and women and other peoples who are killed, and they've had a gigantic cost in terms of money and resources and people diverted to the war. When can we look forward to reducing the huge spending on these wars, and is it possible that kind of funds could help us square up our budget and give us crucial resources to strengthen our economy right here at home? Well, uh, you know, I, I said uh, at a speech I made at West Point talking about Afghanistan that uh, I'm interested in nation building here at home. That's, that, that's the nation I want to build more than anything else. Uh, as you know, because it was a big issue when I was campaigning here in Iowa, I was opposed to the war in Iraq from the start. I made a commitment that I would bring that war to a responsible end. We have now ended our combat mission in Iraq, and we've pulled out 100,000 troops out of Iraq since I was in office. So, um, so that's a commitment we followed up on. Now, Afghanistan uh, was a war that most people right after 9-11, I think, overwhelmingly understood was 
important and necessary. We had to go after those who had killed 3,000 Americans. Uh, we had to make sure that al-Qaeda did not have a safe haven inside Afghanistan to plan more attacks. And, you know, you can speculate as to whether if we hadn't gone into Iraq, we had just stayed focused on Afghanistan, whether by now we would have created a stable situation and we would not have a significant presence there. But that's not what happened. Uh, and so when I walked in, what we had was a situation in Afghanistan that had badly deteriorated over the course of seven years and where the Taliban was starting to take over half of the country again. Uh, you had a very weak Afghan government and in the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan, you had al-Qaeda still plotting to attack the United States. Now, I had said during the campaign, we need to make sure that we're getting Afghanistan right. Uh, and what I committed to when I came into office was we'll put additional resources, meaning troops and money on the civilian side, to, tr to train up Afghan forces, make sure that, that the Afghan government can provide basic services to its people. But what I also said is we're not going to do it in an open-ended way. We're going to have a time frame within which Afghans start having to take more responsibility for their own country. Uh, and I said that on July of next year, we're going to begin a transition of uh, shifting from U.S. troops to Afghan troops in many of these areas. Now, uh, the situation there is very tough. You know, Afghanistan is the second poorest country in the world. There are a lot of countries in the world. This is the second poorest. It has a 70% illiteracy rate. Afghanistan was much less developed than Iraq was. And it had no uh, significant traditions of a strong central government that could provide services to its people or a civil service or just the basic infrastructure of, uh, of a modern nation state. So uh, we're not going to get it perfect there. It is messy, it is hard, and you know, the, the toughest job I have is when I deploy young men and women uh, into a war theater because some of them don't come back, and I'm the one who signs those letters uh, to, to family members uh, offering condolences for the enormous sacrifice uh, of their loved ones. Uh, but I do think that what we are seeing is the possibility of training up Afghan forces more effectively, keeping pressure on al-Qaeda so that they're not able to launch big attacks, and that over the next several years, as we start phasing down, those folks start lifting up. Here's the impact it'll have on our, uh, on our, on our budget. Um, you know, there are going to be still some hangover costs from these two wars. The most obvious one being uh, veterans, which you know, we haven't always taken care of as well as we should have, and I've had to ramp up veteran spending significantly because I think that's a sacred trust. They've served us well. We've got to serve them well. Um, and, and that means you know, services for post-traumatic stress disorder, reducing backlogs in terms of them uh, uh, getting disability claims, uh, help specifically for women veterans who are much more in the line of fire now than they'd ever been before. All those things cost some money. So there's no, even as we start winding down the war in Afghanistan, it's not as if there's going to be a huge peace def, uh, dividend right away. But what it, what it does mean is we'll be able to more responsibly manage our military budget. And this is another example of where you know, you can't say you want to balance the budget and not take on reform in the Pentagon. I mean, we've, we've, we've already pushed hard to eliminate some weapons programs in the Pentagon budget that you know, the generals, the people who actually do the fighting, say we don't need. But getting those programs shut down is very difficult because typically there's not a single weapons program out there that 
doesn't have some part being built in 40 different congressional districts uh, in 10 or 20 different states so that everybody has a political vested interest in keeping it going. Uh, and Bob Gates, my defense secretary, has been really